Welcome back or welcome to the Defining Endurance podcast. I am your host, Coach Andrew Simmons from Lifelong Endurance, and today we're going to talk a little bit about mental preparation. I think we've all, at some point in our racing careers, had one of those races where it just felt like nothing went right. Those thoughts inside your brain were there, and they just kind of took hold and didn't really let you perform the way that you wanted to. Maybe you had a performance that you knew was locked in, the workouts were there, Everything else was falling in line and you might have struggled to be able to actually put out what you wanted to do on race day. Uh, And I think that's one of the biggest things I've seen in preparing athletes for big competitions, especially athletes that have the opportunity to podium. So we're going to do something a little bit different today. Um, I've got a few notes here in front of me, and I'm going to do a solo episode kind of on mental prep for race day. So if you are watching this live on YouTube, uh, you're going to see some note cards in my hand. Um, That's just to help me organize my thoughts. I do not usually like to do a scripted show, but uh, there's a lot to consider here, and I just want to make sure that in putting out an episode that I give you guys as much great content as possible, uh, and I simply just can't do that off the top of my head. Uh, So without further ado, we will dive in. I think the place that I want to start is that for most athletes, when I ask them, hey, what what went wrong, or where do you feel like you're lacking in confidence, Um, you know, they'll they'll often tell me, um, you know, I just, I just, I just didn't feel confident out there. I didn't feel it. Um, and, and I think really a lot of that really comes back to, uh, the idea that, uh, they, they didn't really trust in their training and maybe it wasn't even the fact that, uh, the buildup didn't go the way they wanted, but it was more so just, they didn't feel confident that they could do the thing, um, (laughs) that they needed to do, whether that was break three hours in the marathon, they didn't, you know, even though they may have run 12, 13, 15, 16 miles at that 652 pace needed, uh, they may not have felt that that was enough, right? We always find that place of what is enough and what can we trust in. And so I think that the first and foremost thing is that learning how to trust your training uh, and and I think make those stakes really small at first. Um, That could be something as simple as doing a 5K and saying, okay, I think I can break 20 minutes for this 5K going out, doing workouts, preparing specifically for a 5K and saying, okay, that's my goal. My number one goal is to go and break the 5K in 20 minutes. Then go and do that and be able to say, okay, I can trust that these workouts said I was going to break 20 minutes. I broke 20 minutes. Um, And this can even be working with a coach, someone like myself or anyone else that you may, may work with This is a great way to just kind of line yourself up for success and then slowly start to increase that risk. So 5K to 10K, 10K to half, half marathon to full marathon and building that confidence. Now, a lot of this comes from experience, right? Confidence is built through experience, whether that's experience in workouts, it's experience on race day. The more experiences, the more chances that you've had the opportunity to fail ultimately are what going are going to allow you to really be able to be confident on race day. So if you looked on the start line and you said, oh, there's the guy that's run 30 plus marathons and you can see the guy that's run three. Well, they, there's a lot of knowledge between three and, and 30. Um, and cool, calm and collected is more likely to describe the guy with 30 than three. So the thing is, is that we, we have to start to dial these things in. When you are sitting down to prepare specifically for a race, right? We talked about maybe that 5K, that 10K, that half that you're using to prepare yourself. Um, you know, a couple of questions to kind of ask yourself or even to sit down and work through with your coach is, you know, are you training or have you trained on specific courses? These are great questions to even ask yourself. And if the answer to that is yes, then you know that you've done some sort of specific preparation. That should also, again, go back and build confidence you need to know the demands before you go in, right? Is this race in August or is this race in April? Those are two different demands on your body from heat and humidity, uh, to calorie intake to clothing. All of those things are important to consider. So what are the demands that are going to be put upon you, both physically uh, but also environmentally? Um I think the next place that athletes get stuck, if it's not the confidence, it's that 
we are wired as humans to look for fear, or I should say, may- maybe not fear, but as much as we <laughs> we are are wired to look for problems, right? Um, and we're not internally always these perfect optimists, right? We we would tend to say that if we had a hundred workouts and one of them went poorly, we will forget. 99 of those workouts and focus on the one bad workout we had in leading up to that. And I think one of the things I want to get across here really, really quickly is that you are a product of the work that you continually do. So that means that if you are doing something consistently every day, that is what you are truly a product of. One workout does not define the entire buildup, does not define all of your work that you're doing as an athlete. And that's really important to understand, but it's much harder to do in in reality. Um, I think a lot of athletes can really struggle with conceptualizing uh, that one workout, you know, could have been from many factors. It could have been a lack of sleep. It could have been stress. It could have been the food you ate. It could have been 10,000 other things, but they will think about that one workout for two or three months at times, um, or they will start to then let that take hold, take root, and really spiral them down. Oh, I couldn't hit pace in the last workout, so why would I hit that now? And so those are thoughts. We'll talk all about kind of the mental, actual true preparation side and our our internal mental speak a little bit later here. Um, But the next piece here is how do we then deal with those thoughts that come in? Um, you know, for me, it's, it's been trying to, uh, help athletes, but also myself find a calmness that balances excitement and readiness for race day. Um, you know, I, I consider it kind of this tempered excitement. Um, and even in those last maybe four to six weeks, I think, I think about the idea of kind of leaving a little bit of money in the bank or however you want to look at it is not going, you know, all the way to the well in that last four to six weeks of the buildup, just because, When we do that, sometimes we may be cheating a little bit on our race day. And so all that means is that I'd rather have my athletes and even myself finish workouts feeling like I could have done a little bit more and go, ooh, that's interesting. That feels really good. Instead of finishing a workout completely and utterly depleted, and usually when we get to completely and utterly depleted, that word changes from depleted to defeated. Um, and sometimes if it didn't go as well as we wanted or we weren't, you know, uh, exceeding even our race pace, sometimes that can lead to some, some negative thoughts and some negative, um, buildup internally of, oh, I have to start asking questions about why that didn't go perfectly or why that didn't go as well as I wanted to. But one of the things that I talked about was the idea of excitement and, I think uh, we've so far focused only on kind of the dread aspect of a race, but dread is normally the thing that toes most people down. But on the other side of that is that sometimes people get too excited Uh, and that excitement can show up uh, on the opposite side on race day is I feel amazing. I am going to go and just blast out this pace. And unfortunately, that ultimately ends up in them blowing up early um, and they feel like they can never quite run the race that they wanted to. They've never been, quote unquote, able to put it together. And a lot of that, you know, would go back to not practicing a specific pace, maybe not going in with a specific goal on race day and just kind of going out there and winging it. By majority, when I'm working with an athlete um, that's struggled with this in the past, the thing that I am trying to hammer home is pacing, pacing, pacing and, and learning how to be diligent. I can think of five or six athletes, even in the last month here, that it has been, this was good, but we don't need to get that excited right now. We we need to go and hit 640 pace. It's awesome that you can run 620s. Very happy with that. But we only need to run 640s. And I think a lot of this is understanding how do we take those stair steps in our goals? Because sometimes people get frustrated and they want to automatically go to that 620 pace, that faster pace, because they're like, well, more is better, faster is better. And the reality is, is that you have to succeed in the arena that you're in first. If you have not broken three hours, why are you trying to break two hours and 50 minutes or two hours and 55 minutes for that matter? Let's first start with the first hurdle, right? When you think about lining up for a hurdles race, if it's a hundred meter hurdles and you, you've got seven hurdles to get down in front of you, Don't worry about the last one until you get there. You got to cross the first hurdle and make sure that you set yourself up for every 
other hurdle after that. You can't miss steps. You don't want to chop steps. You want it to be this fluid, nice buildup and be able to focus on the things that are important. So really, I would say is that temper that excitement and really be able to control everything that's in there. Okay, so especially that pacing perspective is that excitement can sometimes also be something that can kind of bite us in the ass. And that's never fun, uh, especially when we're feeling good, because that that page can turn really, really quickly. Now, again, later in the episode, we are going to talk through what happens when those things show up. Oh, my gosh, my pace is dropping off all of those things. How do we handle when those things pop up? How do we not get overwhelmed? How do we not get completely in over our head? start walking. The last thing I'll say here is uh, a a lot of people will say that routine is the enemy. And I simply have to answer that back with maybe for every other sport, but for runners, routine is one of our best things, especially leading into race day. Routine, routine, routine. I like athletes to try and stick to rhythm inside their weeks. Normally we do Tuesday, Friday workouts for a lot of the athletes that I build up, but also making sure that you're keeping to a rhythm of when do you eat? When do you do your long run? Again, sometimes that may be specific preparation and making sure that we keep to that natural rhythm of our body. Um, We really have to live on it because We have to also be able to adjust that rhythm if we go into different time zones and be aware of how our natural rhythms are going to come into play as we prepare. Uh, One of the things that athletes often struggle with a lot is sleep and getting enough sleep leading into a race. Uh, At the very end here, uh, I'm going to do a quick Q&A about five questions about how do we actually get some better sleep before race day? What days of sleep really, really matter? How much do we actually really need the night before? And how can we kind of optimize that um, with just some tools that we've got on hand here? This next part of the episode is really going to kind of break down into individual sections. We're going to talk a little bit about visualization, uh, when the heat is on. So when when we're in the heat of racing, how do we handle anything that's, that's thrown at us, some roadblocks? Um, And then ultimately, uh, kind of how do we get through those negative thoughts and a couple of tools to help you guys practice uh, while you're training and not just hoping that these things show up on race day. Uh, Again, go back to uh, we are what we continuously do. So the first one, one of the biggest things that has helped me and helped a number of my athletes is visualization. Um, You know, our brains, as I said, are are, are wired to look for threats. Um, You know, running often demands uh, and challenges us to do the opposite of convention. Most people aren't going to go out and run 20 miles for fun because it it doesn't feel good. We are going to encounter and purposely put ourselves in a place of pain and discomfort. And by majority, our bodies are always trying to seek comfort. So seeking discomfort automatically puts us in a different place from a mental perspective. Um, But again, our brains are wired to look for the bad thing. Just like I said earlier, if we have 100 workouts and 99 of them go well, we're going to focus on the one that didn't. Um, so how, how do we then start to visualize uh, things going well? How do we turn that table? Well, it's reps. It's practice. It's going out and actually trying to do purposeful visualization. Now, if I'm sitting here and I'm thinking about an upcoming race, I'm going to race the Austin Half Marathon. I've seen the profile of the course, um, you know, and I have a rough idea of, you know, it's an urban environment. I've got a rough idea of what it might look like. I've never been to Austin itself, but having raced a half marathon before, and many, many of them before, in fact, I know roughly what it's going to feel like. I know roughly how long I'm going to be out there. And so I, I'm one of those people that, for me, visualization is truly taking some time to put on headphones, to put on just some, you know, no words music, like either a jam band or I'm just going to listen to like some lo-fi hip hop or something that, uh, you know, ha- isn't going to distract me from visualizing and thinking, something that might even have a beat that I can follow along with and kind of fall into. And I'm one of those people that likes to physically close my eyes and I like to think through things. I like to think through, you know, what I imagine the start line to be like. Um, You know, I'm going to imagine, you know, it's probably going to be pretty cool and pretty calm. Um, 
And, you know, I'm probably going to be in a singlet and a pair of gloves, shorts. Um, you know, I'm going to actually be feeling kind of that cool air on my skin. I'm thinking that deeply about what's it going to feel like. And when that gun goes off, the first thing that I always think of is one, don't trip, don't fall right now, not a good time to fall. But also I am more so thinking about, okay, I need to get out, find myself in a good position. I need to find a group of people, but then I need to settle into my pace as soon as I possibly can. I don't want to be looking down at my watch and seeing 450 pace when I'm really trying to hit like 550 pace uh, for a whole for a whole race. I want to get into that. I want to get into my rhythm. And then I want to start working on just trying to relax and breathe. We'll talk all about breathing here in a minute. But that visualization is so important because I want to see myself relaxing. I want to see myself with dropped shoulders. I want to see myself in really good form. And I want to see myself with a smile on my face or a look of focus and kind of imagining myself almost in the third person that I am looking down on myself on this race course. Maybe I'm with a group of people and I'm thinking about how I'm feeling. I'm thinking about, you know, how this is going to go well. I'm imagining physically grabbing a cup of water and being able to pour it down my back or put it in my mouth and seeing all of the things that maybe have tripped me up before going really successfully. I see myself fueling two or three times you know, kind of walking through that race plan and saying, oh, I want a coffee gel for the last gel that I'm going to have. It can get that specific. But visualization is so important because it allows us to take a narrative that we design for ourselves and then go execute it. Think of it like choreography. This is a visual choreography of your race. So physically seeing yourself, if you're an obstacle course racer, succeeding on that obstacle that you failed. Uh, if you're you know, in an ultra and you've gotten to an aid station in the past for two or three races and it, it's always been a place that you've pulled out or you can imagine seeing it even though you haven't been in the race, um, you know, I can think back to the Winfield aid station at Leadville 100. Number of people that drop out there or make choices there that affect the rest of their race is huge. So I encourage any of my athletes that run Leadville to think about those aid stations that they've volunteered at. Actually physically go there in your mind. What's it going to feel like to walk into that aid station? And even more so, how does it feel to walk out of it? How does it feel to have your poles in your hand pulling you up that next major climb? How does it feel to feel fueled? right? How, do, how does it feel? I know that sounds very weird, but we can visualize feelings. If we can visual, visualize colors, we can visualize how we feel. What is it? How do we present? How do we show up? And I think one of the people I want to talk briefly here, and I know a lot of you guys will know this person, Elliot Kipchoge, and he is known for taking the time to smile during the later stages of the race. And they've shown that through studies that actually smiling and you know kind of forcing your body in a way to be like this isn't that bad that is a great visualization technique is to imagine yourself smiling and enjoying the course even though these things are hard we still do them because they challenge us and we do them for enjoyment so let that show up he's able to find a way to put his brain and mentally in a place where he's able to go and even though he's in extreme amounts of pain You'd never see it on his face. It's an amazing thing to watch. If any of you have not seen the Breaking 2 project from Ineos, it is a wonderful insight into that man's life, but also how they executed something that is uh, extraordinary, the first human to break two hours in the marathon. So definitely worth watching, but also imagine the visualization. Imagine going through all of those things. Um, so a couple things, right? Formulate a picture of success. Uh, you know, what is your place of unlimited possibility? And what I mean by that is if you are trying to break that three hour mark or you're trying to finish a, a crazy big ultra, or it's one of the biggest races you've ever done. I like to imagine that finish line. Imagine what that finish line will look like in your mind and imagine yourself coming across that finish line successful. And put those and stack those ideas and those positive visualizations in your mind. And this means that you do need to take time in the two weeks leading up, two, three, four minutes a day, lay on the ground, sit on your couch, whatever it is, close your eyes and let yourself walk through that. 
that is a great way to kind of deal with those anxieties and nerves that can come up. So actually physically taking the time, you have to take action. Another thing here is developing positive self-talk uh, as workouts and moments get tougher and more intense. You're going to have tough workouts. You're going to have long, extensive, hard efforts that you're going to put out for race day. This is a great time to practice those visualizations. Put those in your mind. Frame those in your mind. They can even have a soundtrack to them. But also that positive self-talk here is super important. You know, telling yourself, I am capable, I, I can do this, and just giving yourself those little nuggets. Again, stacking those wins when you're physically out there doing the workouts and then making sure that you reflect on them. This is so important. If you're not taking the time to have a confidence journal, taking the time to mentally cache those moments in your mind, how are you ever going to draw on them? How are you ever going to look back and go, oh, yeah, September 13th, I had a phenomenal workout and I was just murdering those splits. That was great. And I felt so good. And I told myself that I had this and I was using these words. And I saw myself doing X, Y, Z. Super, super important here. And absolutely critical that you're actually making these wins, these positive self-talk, these moments, this cash in your brain or on paper and giving it as something that you can come back to. These could even be just in the notes and training peaks or in your workouts um, so that you can come back to them. You want to be able to draw on these. When, when you read through any article and when you ask an athlete, how do you have so much confidence? Well, I trust in my training. Well, they trust in their training because they track it. They write about it. They think about it. They analyze those moments that they were just in because those are the things that they're going to draw on. So if you do not track your data and how you feel and how you interpret those tough workouts and those tough situations, it's going to be a long time to improve on hope. Last thing here is define how you'll handle specific scenarios that you have that have plagued you in the past, whether that's coming through an aid station and you know just feeling like you've been crushed and you know or that you're coming in depleted. How do you handle those? How are you actually going to handle things that are thrown at you? What if you do get a blister? What if you have to poop in the middle of a marathon? You know, thinking through all of these things. What if you miss a gel? What if you miss a water stop? How do you handle that? Um, you know, I, I think the Mike Tyson quote here fits really well. You know, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Well, here's the thing, guys. Plan to get punched in the face and, and more than once. I have described that. Uh, if there's one sport that I think is a lot like running, it's boxing, okay? When we think about racing and we truly think about having an opponent or opponents out there, we have to be willing to not only take some punches, which could mean someone throws in a surge or there's a hill or someone does something that's outside of the normal plan. That would be taking a punch. That'd be taking one right on the chin. But here's the beautiful thing is that there's also you involved and that visualization of succeeding and actually throwing that punch, having that kick, being able to out sprint a competitor, to be able to make a move on a competitor in a really defining and just absolutely just defined way that you have made a very definite move that no one is going to be able to follow or you're able to hit those paces and those splits or being able to handle that tough situation and being able to rebound from it and be able to come out of it. So super, super important that you are not always just looking at this visualization of from a positive lens, but being able to also say, okay, what are the tools that I need to have? If I drop a gel, if I drop water, what am I going to do? How do I not freak out and let that negative thought control my whole, right? My, my whole psyche. You drop a gel, you drop hydration, it, it can absolutely take you down in the heat of battle. So let's talk about that. When the heat is on, um, you know, I think you have to start with what got you prior success. If you are trying to go and win a race for the second time or just trying to go improve on a course that you've raced before, a couple of things to consider. Um, as I said, start with what got you prior success and take the time to sit down and write that out. Again, you need to actually physically go through and detail your training, detail both the mental, physical, and physiological things that are important to you. Um, you know, I, I like the first question of asking is, what has worked before for success? Meaning, 
Uh, you know, that, that means, did I take a shower in the morning of the race? Uh, what did I eat the morning of the race? What did I eat the day before the race? What time did I eat before the race? Uh, did I fly in two days beforehand? Did I fly in three? Did I get there the morning of and, you know, sleep in the car? Like, I know that all these things might seem, you know, minor, but they are all little clues, okay? And one of my great mentors in life gave me a quote that I will give to all of you now is that success leaves clues. And success leaves clues, especially when we go looking for it. But you have to first be willing to sit down and analyze your success and not just think that it happened randomly. Nothing nothing happens randomly. You prepared for it whether you thought about it or not. But you are the one that has to go through that analyze analyzing process or even sitting down with your coach and just making sure that you guys are going back and forth asking really good questions. So that same question is also important about what has worked in workouts, right? We're going from, uh, you know, oh, I eat this before I go out and run every time. But then when you eat that thing before a race, it may not do the same. So making sure that you are also testing things in workouts, you may have struggled with nutrition or hydration or any of those things in the past. And what you really need to do is now take a lens of, okay, is, is there a, a place here for optimization? Can I change my fueling strategy or my hydration stat strategy? Again, one of the first things I talked about was being specific. So if we know that if we're specific about something, that means our preparation needs to be. And this is where that comes in is that when the heat of battle is on, you don't want to have to think, uh, am I thirsty? Am I not thirsty? You need to know, right? You do need to self-analyze in the moment and say, I'm thirsty. I need to, I really need to make sure that I get that water. Now, this is where sometimes that illogical response, because we're excited, because we're in the heat of this, we may make some really irrational decisions because we're caught in the heat of the moment. And I'll describe a scenario when I was racing. Uh, and the first time I stopped to take water, um, I was in the Indianapolis uh, Monumental Marathon. I think this was 2014, maybe even the 2015. I'd have to check to be official. Um, but I knew that I was potentially on course for a PR. I was feeling really, really good. I was getting really excited. And I, I missed grabbing a water cup um, at the very start of the, um, at the very start, I guess, the aid station of the, of the water stop area. And by the time I got halfway through, um, I had to kind of just self-regulate and go, I need water right now. I have to stop and walk and get water, one. And then I, I got to the very end and there was actually Gatorade, two, and I got back running. Now, I had to really, you know, that was, that was hard for me mentally in the moment because that may have wasted 15 seconds. And I knew I was going to PR by more than 15 seconds, but that 15 seconds at mile 20 probably saved me a minute and a half on the back end because I may have gotten too dehydrated um, or just not get my stomach could have started to flip over things like that because I was pushing myself at my limit. And so be willing to also think through those scenarios. Like I said, that if you do miss water, be willing to walk, know how to handle that. And what are you going to do? What action are you going to take in the moment when the heat is on? We often start to make really bad decisions. Now, decision making and things like that come into some really cool Q&A here that we're going to get into. So how do we then handle when the heat is on? How do we handle not letting those bad thoughts or negative things kind of creep into our brain and really start to spiral us out? So one of the things that if you've ever raced against me, raced with me, um, or just been in a workout with me, one of the things that I believe is that there's a huge power in deep breathing. Uh, and deep breathing as a technique of just trying to take some breath in and taking a long breath out. And I like to think about it as resetting my physical breath, that if I'm starting to come up a hill and I get into that really high breathing pattern, I need to reset and bring myself back down to my normal marathon, half marathon, 10K, 5K breathing and not let myself spiral out unless I am at that point in the race where I am putting everything I can into it and I am just trying to, to finish and get that finish kick. So a lot of this goes into the idea of tools to practice and this deep breathing one is thinking about taking in through your nose, out through your mouth. 
Now, taking in a long breath. And trying to do that when you're running takes practice. But what that does is it signals our body to relax. It's a deep breathing technique, whether you're doing it laying in your bed trying to fall asleep. Again, this will come in later. Or doing it when you are in the middle of a race. Now, I can promise you that if you're racing against somebody and you're in a 5K and you hear your opponent go, guess what? You better start worrying because they're relaxing while you're stressing out. Now, also, how does that look to your opponent? If you're racing somebody and you take a nice deep breath and maybe you're a little more uh, emphatic on the way out and just make it a little loud enough so that they can hear it. Mentally, what does that do to your opponent? That's going to get in there a little bit. And that might go, ooh, this is easier for them than it is for me right now. They're looking really relaxed. They're looking really confident. You might be stressing out. You might be at 10, but you can't show your cards yet. You can't let people see that. Another tool to practice here is progressive relaxation. Um, this is, again, this is a great thing to do in long runs or even during some longer reps on the track where you're trying to hold a more relaxed form and you're not trying to be rigid. So thinking about like lowering your ears. I know that sounds super weird. Relaxing your jaw. When I'm running really hard and really fast, even like 400 meter reps or even in a 5K, I really just want to drop my jaw and I, I want to just kind of let it almost kind of just, you know, be loose as possible. Everything on me needs to be loose except the things that are moving me forward, my arms and my legs Everything else needs to be relaxed. Excess mus muscle tension is useless and pointless when we're running. So just chill. But think about progressively relaxing. Okay, I'm going to relax my ears, my jaw, my neck, my chest, my abdominals. I'm going to try and relax my legs. And sometimes this even progressive relaxation just means that you hit a mile split. And you just kind of shake it all out. You know, you just kind of shake those shoulders, shake your arms out, and kind of hit reset. Same thing with that breathing is that's a good time to, you know, take a nice deep breath, shake it all out on the exhale, and then move on and getting to that next mile. The last thing here is, is thinking about, you know, that tool of not getting too far ahead. Like I talked about not worrying about that last hurdle when you're at the first hurdle is also just run that mile that you're in. Um, you know, run, run right here right now. And don't worry about one individual split. Again, if you have one split that's off in 26.2 miles, it's more than likely not going to impact the complete and utter outcome of that race. If you're off by three seconds and yes, you didn't PR by three seconds and clearly boohoo, that was that one. But guess what? You probably should have ran the whole race more aggressive and not just tried to PR by three seconds. Just saying. Uh, but again, that's, that's neither here nor there. Um, so to kind of recap here, tools to practice, nice deep breathing. It can be both used as a relaxation technique, but also as kind of a reflexive technique when it's really, really heat of battle and you need to make that little move on your opponent. Progressive relaxation, uh, just kind of working down the body, but then ultimately doing a full physical body reset, just kind of shaking it all off. Now, what happens when those thoughts and negative things hop into your brain? We've all had them. We see that split on the watch. It's 10 seconds too slow. And that last one was 10 seconds too slow. Things are starting to kind of dial down and you're, you're really feeling like things are getting hard and it's at mile 16 of 26 and boy, things are going south and we're starting to get really negative and we start telling ourselves this story that we can't do this that our legs are not going to be able to carry us. And yep, that one workout, that did it. That damn workout that I, that I didn't get right. Well, here's the reality, guys, is that these thoughts are, are actually really harmless. Those negative thoughts that come out are, are, are often not real. Uh, it's, our, it's our subconscious thoughts uh, becoming actualized. And the more we feed into them and think about them, the further they spiral us down. And what we have to do, and I know this sounds so weird to say, but we have to treat them gently and not abruptly. These are things that we have to first recognize and say, oof, I'm having some negative thoughts right now. And then, again, practice. When we have negative thoughts, what do we do about them? Right? This may be a good time to shake it off, try to reset, and get back into your pace. This may be a great time that when you're having negative thoughts, that may be a cue to say, ooh, I might need to fuel right now. I might need to hydrate. 
I'm starting to get a little foggy in my brain and things are starting to get a little negative. I need to go back to my training. What did I do when I had negative thoughts during that 120 miler? I just had to eat and I just had to like let myself slow down for a second and then I was able to rally. Now, uh, one of our guests on this podcast actually commented on a post I had on Instagram and I think it's really relevant right now. And it was a post about how pain is not linear. Pain, pain is something that we can experience in waves and we can experience in moments and in long, long stints. When, when we think about it, there's probably points throughout a marathon, even in the middle of the race, that are more painful and, and have a greater amount of discomfort than even the last three miles. But again, we always kind of have that wall, that visualization in our, in our minds when we look back on a race where we're experiencing, all we're experiencing is pain and discomfort in a race. And it's not always real. It's, it's that momentary moments of doubt that then you start to spiral and self-actualize and go, man, this is hard. I am feeling a lot of pain. My legs really do hurt. And oh, that blister. And right, we, you can see how that spirals really, really quickly. And I want you guys to ask, is this real? Am I actually experiencing this pain right now? Or is this momentary? And by majority, it's momentary. Unless you're physically bleeding and have a huge blister and things like that. Like, great. That's, that's, that's a reality. But guess what? You can keep going. You have to then let the mind overcome it. And so let's talk about some of those mental tools is that we have to really throw away those negative thoughts, get back to positive thoughts, okay? So by majority, when we have a bad behavior that we do not want to have, we first have to recognize that we're having a bad behavior, right? We have to recognize that, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm being negative right now. And then we have to take action. We have to have some tools in our tool belt to be able to move ourselves forward. So throw away the negative thoughts. Ah, I don't need those right now. Get back to positive. I'm capable. I believe in myself. Don't be afraid to hurt. Some of those things that can help us take deeper steps beyond where we thought we were capable, but we have to practice those. So when you hit a hard point in a workout, when you are in the middle of a long run and you're really suffering, think about what you tell yourself if this was a race. What do you need to hear for yourself? I'm capable or what do you need to do in terms of taking an action? Do you need to fuel? Do you need to hydrate? Do you need to look at your wrist because you've got some motivational quote on there that's something that is is driving you forward? It could be a grandmother's name. It could be uh, the organization that you're out there running for. It could just be that you have a time that you want to hit and you've got to get back on that horse. You've got to get out there and get back after it. And because you're hurting right now does not mean you're going to hurt in 10 minutes. And that's so, so important. This goes back to knowing your why. Why are you out here? Why are you racing this? What are you trying to hunt down? What are you really trying to get after? This is kind of that mental positioning. Um, again, that could be that, that time that you've written down, that goal that you have for yourself, is really to just focus on the process of the race. Get to that next mile marker and try to get back on pace. I have had many races where I've fallen off for two or three splits. I had to eat. I had to hydrate get my shit together. And I was able to get back and rally one, two, three times. I've had to take multiple bathroom breaks. And especially in the last time I ran Chicago, I took three times to pee because I overhydrated the day before, but I had to get back out there and chase down that sub three hour group. Cause that was my goal for the day. I didn't have a great buildup. I was not in two thirties shape. I was in barely three hour shape. And each time that I stopped and used the bathroom, I had to catch back up to the group I took a pee break at 3, at 17, and at 21. 21 was not the hardest one for me to get back to. 13 was because I really had to make a choice. Yeah, am I strong enough to go push some 630s for a little bit to get back to this group? It was hard. It was absolutely hard. And I had to then strategize the next two times I had to pee. I did my 630s, getting ahead of the group a little bit to go pee and then catch the group. There's a lot of strategies. It's the one I used. So let's, let's recap here. Tools to practice when it comes to negative thoughts, mental, mental little blocks we have is making sure that you, one, recognize that these are harmless. Two is interrupt the thought. And then the three is take action. You need to do something about it, even if it means that you're going to tell the person next to you, man, I am really suffering right now. 
Well, you might hear from somebody else. I'm suffering too. Let's do this together. Great. It's out there in the open and it's gone now. Now you've got somebody else that's in the same place you are and now you're going to work together. And it might help to even hype that person up. Be like, did you got this? And guess what? They're going to reciprocate. And that's what can drive you to the finish line. I can tell you this year alone, I've had multiple athletes that have found a partner while they were in a race. They made their race buddy, that tactical person that pushed them. So if you have that person and you're hearing this, one, send this podcast to them as a way of saying thank you for being an awesome race buddy. But also, two, do take time to thank them. I do, uh, I've, I've been blessed enough to pace many marathons uh, on my day, uh, about 10 to 15 of them. And the best thing I ever got was someone sent me a card that said, thank you so much for being a positive part of my race and helping me accomplish my goal. I wasn't their coach. I was just a positive influence in their race, in their day that got them to a finish line. That's awesome. And it's one of those things that I still keep on my wall. Uh, If I have it, I'll put a picture of it um, uh, if I remember to uh, up on the YouTube video that goes along with this episode. Um, going back to why are you here? Positioning yourself, knowing your why is super important. All right. Are you guys ready for a little Q and a, uh, there's been a couple questions I've had over the years and I've taken the time to try and kind of write them down. So I got five questions here. I'll try to be quick, but a lot of them have applicable outcomes and things that I think you guys can put into use. So first question, I'm a marathoner. Um, and I find uh, that in races, uh, I have a difficulty not walking. uh, And as a result, I sacrifice my goal. So let's talk about the what's really happening here with this athlete. Um, You know, when, when athletes stop to walk, they often first look at that as a failure. Um, but sometimes you guys need to look at that as a tool for success. So first of all, if you're new to marathoning um, and your goal is I'm going to try and do this whole thing without walking, um, it really comes back to, is that, is that a reasonable goal to have? Um, you know, is this, is this a process goal um, or, or is what, what's really happening here? Because if your whole goal is to, you know, run a, a, a 415, but secretly you don't want to walk the whole thing, which, which one matters more? Um, so I, I think that's, that's such a, a huge part of this is, um, you know, what, what kind of goal is this? Um, you know, process goals, uh, can, can be a little sticky, um, because oftentimes if we have a, a goal that we, we want to achieve, um, you know, through, through, uh, how do I explain this? Um, if you want to run that 415 marathon, it may require that you walk. And so the first thing you have to do is be, be ready to, to go out there and walk. And that's an okay thing. So give yourself a process goal and, and like what lines you up to lines you up for success. Um, I really want you guys to think about breaking these things into pieces. Is that, okay, I, I'm going to try, and if I'm going to do 4.15, uh, I'm going to break this race up into thirds, and I need to get through the first 10 miles at this pace, and then I want to get to mile 20 by this pace, and then mile 6. And each of those may have a theme that you are trying to relax through 10. You are trying to you know, stay consistent and be positive through 20. And then at six, you're going to push yourself as hard as you can. So breaking those little things up into pieces. Um, you know, plan how to, how to manage any of those roadblocks that come. What if you feel like you want to walk? What if you want to feel like you want to walk really, really bad? Well, you know, there may be verbal cues and say, I don't have to walk. I'm powerful. And it may just mean that you have to slow down and not quite walk. And that's okay. You may have to break out of that pace. And it comes back to what's more important, not walking or running a 415. Can you run, walk a 415 and get your goal? Which of those goals actually matters more? So know your priority goal on race day. So to answer, um, you know, how do you not sacrifice your goal? The first thing is you got to make sure you know what your goal is and why, why are you stuck on not walking in a race? That's kind of the more important goal to, excuse me, goal question to answer here. Number two, should I do pre-sleep visualization? Is it helpful to work through uh, the sticking points through my race? Pre-sleep, the key thing here. Um, Man, I I, I think visualization is best kept to the daylight hours. Um, Pre-sleep visualization can lead to a lot of uh, increased peaking anxiety before you go to bed. 
Um, nobody wants that. Um, it can lead to a lot of spiraling. It can lead to a lot of uh, questions, but also you're just hurting your ability to sleep. You need to kind of be wound down and let your, let your body, uh, you know, actually focus on sleeping and not worrying about a race. Um, you know, if you do have those questions that pop up or feel like there are things that are unanswered, you know, that's when I tell athletes to shoot me a text. My phone's already off anyways, um, at night. So you're not going to interrupt me, but the best thing you can do is try to, uh, have, have your pre-sleep or your, have your, your visualization, uh, you know, really, uh, focused on doing doing it during daylight hours that you can get a hold of your coach, you can ask those questions, set up that phone call, but also not you don't want to set up your dreams for that man. Your dream your dreams are for for beautiful things. They're for thinking about how you're going to run that and having a successful race and truly dreaming about it and absorbing it. If you are one of those people that has those panic nightmares uh, that you're running through mud or uh, feel like you can't move and you're in the middle of your upcoming race you probably need to talk about your race. I know that this sounds goofy, um, but you probably need to just kind of talk through some of those anxieties. Pick up that phone call, call a friend with experience, call your coach. Man, you know, I had this crazy dream. I can't tell you how many times I've had this with an athlete. I had this crazy dream of this, this, and this. And it's like, well, where does that show up? You know, that may mean that you are ultimately really struggling uh, with feeling confident on race day and feel like you can't hit those paces. And you may just need to hear or have somebody show you that you are on track for your goals and that subconsciously you have a lot of hangups and anxiety that you just need to express, put them out into the world and let them live there, right? Again, take those negative thoughts, push them out. It's very hard, but you have to practice. And sometimes it means just verbalizing them like we talked about earlier. Question number three. How do you handle athletes putting too much pressure on themselves? I've seen a lot of people do unconscious sabotage. My goodness, it is difficult. It's very hard to see and you hate to see it. Um, you know, working a lot with youth, uh, they can unconsciously sabotage themselves that they look down and they see the instantaneous pace on their watch and they automatically let that story happen right then and there. Oh my goodness, I was supposed to hit 6.30s and my watch just said 7.10. Well, wait a second and look at that watch again and you'll be surprised that it might be 620. Your instantaneous pace in your watch is a pretty bad way to analyze a moment. How do you actually feel? Okay. And sometimes when we look at our watch, like, man, I feel like I'm going so slow. And then you see that whoop, game's over, right? People can just, that's it. That was moment in time. You watch it happen. They just shut down. Um, so how do we prevent that? How do we uh, prevent unconscious sabotage? And, you know, that decision-making is often a stress response, um, and it's a protective mechanism. Um, sometimes we're actually even afraid to succeed, and that's really, really crazy. Uh, but again, it's super common um, that we can be on the precipice of succeeding, and I've seen athletes cut other athletes off. I've seen uh, and become DQ'd for it. I've seen athletes... Um, that literally just like they stop and walk because they've become so overwhelmed in the last 300 or 400 as they're about to PR, they're about to win. And truly what happens is that they have told themselves that they are not capable. And they, that self-belief becomes so overwhelming and that they get so caught up in it that the only thing they can think to do is, is not let that moment happen and not let that actually be realized. Uh, it's it's kind of like I think about my, my dog. My dog has chased rabbits and ducks uh, her whole life. Mabel loves those animals, you know, chasing those things. She's just got a huge prey drive. But I wonder what would happen if she actually got a hold of one. I don't think she'd know what to do with it. And I think that's where a lot of athletes are is that you've been hunting and hunting and hunting, but what happens when you actually get it? And some of us have to truly take those small baby steps to truly take those small wins at a 5k and then a 10k and then a half and slowly get more conditioned to having success and achieving our goals. Everybody would love to think that achieving our goals is an easy thing. Um, and that, that doing so and executing is, 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 e is easy and feels good for everybody, but it doesn't. And that's the thing that we really have to understand is that how people view achieving and completing their goals is different for you. It's different for me. It's different for people that I coach. And so it's making sure that we understand and visualize our success that we are desiring. What are we truly desiring? And seeing ourselves actually succeeding and winning can be difficult. We have to think about it and practice it. These are reps, people. It's no different than doing reps on the track. It's just mental reps, visualization, thinking about it and believing that you can succeed. 
So setting process goals versus outcome goals. Um, this is that, that whole pressure piece I was trying to talk to on that first question about not walking is that process goals are often what we have to do before we can achieve an outcome goal. That if you are trying to run a 415 marathon, but you've never finished a marathon yet, and you want to try and do it without walking, my goodness, these are all different pieces of a process goal. You may have to run walk that first marathon to finish it. And then once you have finished it, then you can go back and change how you prepare and try to run and build yourself from being a one-time marathon finisher to a two, three, four, and build yourself so that you can run for longer distances and longer times and ultimately be able to, more than likely, run without stopping for that four hour and 15 minute goal. But you have to realize that there are steps to these things and stair steps and all of this and progress, they aren't linear. So setting process goals versus outcome goals. Outcome goals are always that time on the clock. I want to finish first. Uh, I want to finish in under four hours and 15 minutes. I want to qualify for the Boston Marathon. These are outcomes, but outcomes require you to first succeed through a series of process goals. And so making sure that you also have process goals that are set up alongside your outcome goals. That may mean I want to stick to my hydration plan. I want to have a nutrition plan that I follow. Or even in leading up to the race, I want to lose X number of pounds before I get into my race because that outcome of that goal of losing the weight means that I can run faster. So remember that process goals lead to outcome goals. Question number four, how do you sleep the night before the event? Usually, not well. Uh, I tend to be a bad sleeper in general, um, but the reality is, is that you don't have to be. Um, and I have actually found a couple of things that work really, really well for me. Um, if I can get four or five hours of sleep before a race, that's awesome. Um, but I've also learned over the years that uh, it's two nights before, even three nights before, even the week before, that's the sleep that matters most. So first thing I do is kind of progressive relaxation. If you remember, we were talking about this uh, as a tool to use when the heat is on. Well, it also shows up here during uh, as we're trying to sleep um, and just progressively relaxing, starting at the ears and working down. I love to put on headphones. Uh, I've got the new AirPod Pros and they fit in my ears really nicely and I can fall asleep in them or I take them out as I'm kind of half groggily awake, kind of putting them on my nightstand uh, and I actually really like to listen to guided meditation. I don't use any apps. I just find one that I like on Spotify or on YouTube. And uh, as I start to find myself getting really, really groggy, I just take my headphones out and turn off my phone, uh, which works well with YouTube. Um, you know, as I said, two nights before sleep is the most key, the most important. Um, and if you're looking for one last thing, if you're uh, a, a bad person like me and your sleep hygiene is not amazing, uh, I tend to put my iPad on uh, and watch something because I, I need some sort of stimulation and I don't do well just in the dead quiet of a room with a fan on. I have to watch something funny. So Seinfeld or The Office for the millionth time, um, something that is totally just, uh, I don't have to be immersed in a story. It's characters that I've seen a million times. It's a very big place of comfort. It's almost background noise at this point in my life. And so that's a, a good good tool to use to help you also not have stress hormones. You should not watch a scary movie the night before a race because your stress hormones are going to increase. You're automatically going to be more hyper aware and hypersensitive to these things because you're leading into a race. But also, you just need to laugh. You need to relax. We need to just chill. And so watching something that's very chill, even nature documentaries, are a great way to line yourself up for success. For sleeping too. All right, number five, last one here, guys. We are rounding the corner here. I know this has been a long episode. I appreciate you guys staying with me. If you guys are still here and you guys are watching on YouTube, let me know what the most impactful thing that you have found in this discussion uh, and what's been really important to you, what's been helpful to you. Last one here is how do you stay calm and focused during a race? Uh, for me, I am a huge music nerd. I love music and uh, I tend to make playlists. Um, you know, when I can wear headphones, I do. Um, I tend to choose the music that makes me feel something. Uh, I'm not going to, um, you know, listen to classical music while I'm running. That may be your jam and cool. 
go for it. Um, but I want songs that have a lot of energy. I want, you know, music that moves and shapes. So I'll listen to everything from hip hop and rap to like metal and rock to, you know, just, just emotions and being able to have a wide variety and a playlist that is longer than the race that you just plan on running. Here's the thing. I've seen people get caught. They're like, okay, I'm going to create a three hour playlist. And if I finish before the music, I've done it. Well, what happens when the song finishes and <laughs> you've got 800 meters to go or a mile or two miles to go? Bummer. Now you're in no man's land with no music and you got to try to pull your phone out to get yourself going again. Not good. Not fun. Not enjoyable. Plan for three and a half hours of music. That way you can shuffle through a song that may not be fitting the vibe. Get energy from the crowd. This was a big one that I learned as a pacer, um, that as I am running uh, through an area, and if there's a lot of people, man, just lift your arms up, hoot and holler, and that energy, that sound, that just rising crowd noise can just put goosebumps on the back of your neck and give you that that jolt of energy, that feeling, uh, and adrenaline uh, that can just give you that extra boost you need to get up a hill. I can think back to the Boston Marathon. My goodness, I couldn't hear hear a thing from Wellesley all the way until the top of the last hill. Um, it just was a, a wall of noise. And I ran in 2018 during one of the wettest years they've had, and people were still out there screaming for us. So if you're one of those fans that was out there for the 2018 edition, thank you very much. Three final things here is, uh, you know, get pe- get energy from the people around you. And this is just, as I said, having that conversation with the person next to you. If you found that race buddy, like hype them up. Like, dude, you look awesome right now. And sometimes just saying that in hope of reciprocation, like, yeah, dude, you look great too, can help build us up. That idea of kind of expending a little energy outwards, both positive verbal energy to get positive verbal energy back can be a great thing and a really helpful thing. If you're in a small group, let's talk about it. Get those negative things out. Like, oh man, I feel like crap, but you know, I, I think I can really turn the corner, right? Having that optimism in your, in your voice is super, super helpful. And it also helps you stay calm. It means that you're recognizing something, but you're also doing something about it. And that doing something about it just means that you may need to put it out in the world and let it be gone. Think of it like a balloon. You say it, it's off into the ether. All right. So, you know, releasing that negativity and that pain. Sometimes it just feels good to go, ugh, and just let out a, a noise of pain. We've all been there in the gym and we've, we've grunted through some bicep curls or something. Um, you know, just, just doing something to kind of release that energy is super important. Um, and even if we're solo or with some other people, don't be afraid to make some weird noises. I've heard plenty of them, uh, while out racing. Uh, and then just remembering this last and final point, um, is that, you know, staying calm and understanding that pain is not linear. You're going to go through pain. Pain is a natural uh, part of racing. It's a natural part of growth. Um, and so just realizing that you might be in, a, in one tough moment and that you will progress through that moment. You will move through that moment. And here's the thing. Here's where people get, a, get stuck sometimes is that when we experience pain and we experience that discomfort, that's the growth that we spent all this time preparing for. Your growth, those moments of, of challenge, that's really what we signed up for at the end of the day, isn't it? That when we, we hit that mile 20 and things are really hurting and we're, we're, we're in a dark, dark spot, it's about coming out of that spot. It's about that in our training, we're preparing to get out of that, that spot and that, that difficult point. And so when you, when you get into those places, you have to realize that this is what you showed up for. This is what you signed up for. This is what you woke up at 6 a.m. for. Right. And, and, you know, there's, there's a really great thought and idea of like, what have you done yet? What have you done yet to, to get here? Go back, go to that training, go back to the things that you have done. Right. But this may not be the worst pain that you can experience. So can you dig in a little bit more? That's the question you have to answer is that, can you dig a little deeper? Do you have a little more? Can you ask a little more of yourself today, right now in this moment that you spent 12, 16, 20 weeks preparing for? And the answer is usually yes. So with that said, I want to thank all of you guys for joining me uh, on this episode. I know this was a longer solo episode, nearing almost an hour now. um, But these are some of the biggest questions and some of the things that athletes struggle with in mentally preparing for race day and the biggest snares and struggles that they have in succeeding. 
success is not easy. Success and preparing for a great race requires days, weeks, hours of sacrifice and sweat and blood and tears and emotions and setbacks. But when we do succeed and we have visualized it and we have followed that nutrition plan and that hydration plan to a T and it all goes right and I promise you it will, that's what we showed up for. So with that said, I'll let you guys get on and we'll see you guys next time.